Tonight we enter the world of scholars who have diametrically opposing views on the subject of the origins and foundations of what we know today as Western civilization. One school of thought is that it is distinctly African or Afro-Asian in origin. The other, that Western civilization in large measure is the bequest of ancient Greece. Make no mistake, this is not a mere difference of opinion in the ivory tower. The battle itself has become an allegory for something as important as the debate itself. Academic insurgents have breached the ramparts of the acad academy's high priesthood, and the battle is as much for the authority to write history and for how to write history. Our task tonight is to ferret out the truth insofar as we can discern it, but more importantly, to question and challenge. And we have four incredible people with us tonight. Broadly speaking, honestly speaking, the book, Not Out of Africa, a good Southmore effort, is not really about Not Out of Africa. Last year, it was the bell curve. <laughs> this year, it's not out of Africa. Next year, it'll be something else. This is part of a world war against the role of African people in the history of the world. If we began history, began mankind, how is it that the last branch of the human race to enter that arena marked civilization now think they brought civilization? Now, it is part of a war over and above Professor Lester Witz's book and over and above her political naivete. Her naivete is about what is happening in the Western world. There was a recent book called The Tribes. It diagrammed every people, major people on the earth, searching for a piece of turf for themselves. It left out the African people because the other people, including Asian imperialists, have plans to take over Africa. There have been several articles in the New York Times advocating the recolonization of Africa. This book and other literature of this nature mean to prepare the world to accept a rationalization for the re-enslavement of Africa. <laughs> now, and when you deal with the black endorsers of the book, running dogs of the new imperialism, professional white behind kissers. And as Carlos Cook used to say, a disgrace to the skin they wear. <laughs> These people, if I'm be so kind to call them that, are running from themselves and teaching us a lesson that we should have learned long ago sometimes white wannabes are more dangerous than whites. And sometimes they'll fight you harder to be accepted by whites. They are running from their own people and running from definition. Now what we need to look at now is how Professor Lesterwitz neglected the white writers through history, the radical European writers who wrote positively of Africa and who identified uh, the relationship of Africa to the ancient Greece. Now, if given time, and I probably won't be given it this evening, I can prove to you with your satisfaction if you are listening 
that Rome and Greece was not European creations. These were Mediterranean-inspired nations and couldn't be created by Europe because at the time there was no Europe. Let me just begin by saying what my book, Not Out of Africa, isn't about. It's not an attack on Afrocentrism. If Afrocentrism means recognition of African achievements in the world, it doesn't seek to deprive Africans of their rightful heritage. Africans do not need Greece to have a cultural heritage. They have a rich cultural heritage. Egypt is just one part of it. They don't need Greece. I'm concerned because what is being offered in some quarters as African history is really a European myth. And thus, instead of getting real information about Africa, what people are learning is something that's really 18th century French. It's Eurocentric. It's based on Greek and Roman myths. I do not myself think that one should do that because Egypt itself is so fascinating, so rich. There is so much that you can learn and know and that I myself, as a result of all this work that we have been doing for the last four years and more, have come to know and understand about Egypt, I would like to now spend a great deal of the rest of the time that I have learning about that because it is so different. It's so different from the, what the Greeks thought that it was. Herodotus was very impressed by Egypt. He wanted to say that everything in Greece that he could think of came or had some connection with Egypt. He didn't really understand the depth and richness of Egypt, which went in directions way beyond what he knew from his own experience in Greece. So I am concerned about that in not out of Africa. I have tried to explain why the notion of an Egyptian mystery system, which is basically a French invention, it's based on a novel that everyone has forgotten about, but still you can find it in some very obscure libraries, get it up in Boston even, and that that book, which was by a French priest, is based on Greek and Roman sources and tries to describe a Greco-Roman Egypt and that this myth was preserved in Freemasonry and thus came into American culture. So I'm concerned that that myth not be taught, the notion that there was an Egyptian mystery system. Instead, I'd like to see people learn, all people learn, not just black people, white people, any people learn about Africa and the civilizations therein and Egypt is particularly appealing because it's so old, it's so impressive, its role in the Mediterranean was so vast, and so many other civilizations were touched by it. Even if only slightly, they did get touched by it, and we have to work on that. I would like to say, just in my uh, last two minutes, that from my point of view and the point of view of my colleague, Guy Rogers, the ancient world is multicultural and that one cannot study any one bit of it without studying every other bit of it. And the debate tonight, and I hope the debate will go on for many, many years because so many of us will learn from it, that debate uh, should investigate the degree and extent of those links. Myself, as I think you know, I don't think that Greek philosophy was stolen from Egypt. I do not believe there is any evidence to show that. I think that because Egyptian philosophy, and there is such a thing as Egyptian philosophy and deep Egyptian religious thought, which is very, very complicated, and I myself need to know more about it still. Uh, but it's not like the Greeks. It's, uh, it may in many ways be richer and better than some of the concept. Well, you'll have to leave it right there. 
Uh, I agree with Professor Lefkowitz that Africa does not need Greece. There are plenty of glorious African civilizations. It's just that it happens to have Greece or to, a to have influenced Greece to a significant thing. This is not an issue of politics, it's an issue of history, the way things were. Now, Greece is extremely important because it is the single greatest source of European culture. Uh, and therefore, we are concerned with it. And it is very interesting to note that European culture did not begin in Germany or Sweden, but at the extreme southeast corner of Europe. And the reason for that is quite straightforward. It was the closest area to the great civilizations of northeastern Africa and southwest Asia. And these, this East Mediterranean complex was the source of Greek, and hence, I believe, uh, European culture. Now, that's not to deny that there was a great deal of local development within Greece, and I certainly do not propose that Greek, uh, Greek culture was merely a projection or an imitation of Egyptian or Semitic culture. It's clearly a very distinctive culture, but to try and understand Greek culture without knowing the background of the ancient cultures behind it is would be as absurd as it would be to study Japanese culture without knowing the Chinese and Korean roots behind it. And no East Asian specialist would dream of doing that, that you have to see the cultures as interrelated and that the older cultures and the more elaborate cultures had the predominant cultural influence. I, one of our basic disagreements is that Mary Lefkowitz, sitting in the 20th century, feels that she knows better than the Greek historians of the 5th and 4th and 3rd century uh, when they said that there were significant influences. Yes, he was very impressed. Yes, he was very Greek. But what struck him were specific similarities. And uh, Herodotus was rather a plodding historian. He said, well, what are the, what's the reason for these similarities? I think they're too close for coincidence. I don't think the Egyptians could have borrowed them from the Greeks because they've had so long, they've had them so long. Therefore, the most likely explanation is that the Greeks took them from the Egyptians. Uh, and this is what I call the ancient model. And this model was not overthrown until the early 19th century. Now, Mary Lefkowitz mentions the 18th century novels, and at times, despite the attention she's devoted to dismissing my book, I sometimes feel she hasn't read it because I do devote some, uh, quite a few pages to the novel Setos, which she talks, and I too have read it. It had to be sent by interlibrary loan to me. Uh, and I do think it is important in the formation of Masonic thought. But what she does not uh, bring forward is the fact that this was perfectly orthodox history as understood in the 18th century, and going back beyond the 18th century to the view that the Greeks and Romans had of the Egyptian sources of their own culture. Uh, now, I think that the Greeks were, on the whole, a very intelligent people, and I respect their philosophy, their art, uh, their democracy, uh, their science, uh, but I also respect their history, and this is a great anomaly in Mary Lefkowitz's approach, in that she says they're, one, they're very good in these other respects, but they cannot be trusted with their own history. <laughs> that, so that, I want to uh, bring that out, that one has... Now, she says that modern classics has dismissed all this, and it's true that the predominant view of modern classicists is that the debts to Egypt and Phoenicia, and I don't want to underestimate the importance of uh, Levantine or uh, Southwest Asian influences on Greece, that <coughs> these influences uh, were uh, exaggerated uh, by the Greeks, and I think that they clearly were... Uh, a prop, you know, I think they were uh, properly, uh, expect, um, properly developed, and to some extent, uh, the Greeks may even have played down because they were very conscious of being Greek and proud as being Greeks, uh, and they were affected by two forces. On the one hand, they wanted to plug in to the ancient civilizations and give themselves cultural depth. On the other hand, they were very conscious of being Greeks and wanted not to be uh, <clears throat> surpassed culturally by the Egyptians and Phoenicians who were still very much around. So they had two forces working on them. Modern scholars and modern scholars working in intensely racist 
19th and 20th century had no double force. They had the single force wanting to make Greece pure, white, and European, and the ideological pressure that that put on the scholars led to what I see as the recent dismissal of Egyptian and Phoenician influences on ancient Greece. Meaning that Professor Lefkowitz and I are here precisely because we're open to debate about these issues. Three and a half years ago, the University of North Carolina Press asked Professor Lefkowitz and me to put together a volume of responses to some of the questions which are either implicitly or explicitly raised uh, by Professor Bernal in his work, Black Athena. And what I would like to do for just a couple of minutes here, and perhaps expand uh, upon this a little bit later, is to set out some of those questions and to give you some sort of sense of what the preliminary, <laughs> thanks, preliminary answers to the questions that the contributors to our volume found. Obviously, among the important questions that people have been concerned with, number one, were the ancient Egyptians black? Two, did the ancient Egyptians or the Hyksos colonize Greece? Did the, three, did the ancient Egyptians or the Phoenicians massively influence the early Greeks in the areas of language, religion, science, or philosophy? Four, did 18th and 19th century scholars obscure the Afro-Asiatic roots of classical civilization for reasons of racism and anti-Semitism? Let me give you some sense of our conclusions. Number one, the scholars who have looked carefully at the first question have concluded that the attempt to fit the ancient Egyptians into a modernizing category of either black or white, do so from a perspective which lacks both historical and biological justification. <laughs> did, did the ancient Egyptians or the Hyksos colonize what would later become Greek lands in the second millennium. Unambiguous archeological evidence to that effect is lacking in the Mediterranean. Did the ancient Egyptians and the Phoenicians massively influence the Greeks in the area that I outlined? There is no doubt and no one has denied for at least 50 years that I know of that there was Egyptian influence on early Greek culture in several different areas. In areas, actually, that curiously Professor Bernal skips over, like art and architecture. The real scholarly question is, can that influence be described as massive in the sense that Professor Bernal means? And the conclusion which scholars from many different sub-disciplines, and not just classicists, but Egyptologists, Semiticists, and African historians have reached, is that the case cannot be made for a massive influence. Furthermore, students of the ancient world propose a very different model of interaction among the cultures of the ancient world in the time period that we're discussing. Instead of seeing a one-way street leading from Egypt to Greece, scholars now are shaping a model which includes many two-lane highways going from Egypt to Greece, going from Egypt to the Near East, to West Asia, and back in the other direction as well. What about racism and anti-Semitism in 18th and 19th century historiography. Yes, there were some scholars who operated from a framework which we would consider to be 
both racist and anti semitic but an undifferentiated picture of racism and anti semitism cannot be sustained on the basis of the evidence i'd like to ask professor burnell if he could point to some specific instances which he could cite where egyptian thought influenced greek philosophy directly and if he could discuss some of those for us well the uh, greek philosophers uh, were extremely respectful towards uh, egyptian philosophy uh, and uh, particularly plato and particularly plato in his later dialogues uh, the emphasis on geometry uh, which was the great strength of Egyptian mathematics and was the center of the Platonic educational system, uh, I think is one example. Uh, I would also think that the system of uh, ideas or forms which uh, Parmenides and Plato pushed looks extremely Egyptian to me, but I can't prove it. I also think that the distinction between worlds of being and worlds of becoming which fits Egyptian grammar extremely well, and Egyptian cosmological notions extremely well, look uh, very influential. I think that the Greek tradition, which was that uh, Pythagoras and Plato had drawn from Egypt, seems altogether plausible. But what I insist, and here's our major methodological uh, difference, is that I don't believe one can establish proof in these distant areas of history. One has to work on a system of probability, or what I call competitive plausibility. What is less unlikely than the other? Given the closeness of the two countries geographically, the contact that we knew, know was taking place in the 6th and 5th century, uh, when Greek philosophy began to be formed, uh, the likelihood of contact is extremely high, and I think if anyone should uh, have to prove anything, it should be those who would deny that there were significant Egyptian influences on Greek philosophy at this time, as the Greeks themselves associated the word philosophy with Egypt in their earliest references to it. Uh, it seems very strange that uh, the, cha the people who maintain the Greeks' own tradition on this subject should be asked to prove their case rather than those who challenge it. And uh, the predominant view of classicists at the moment uh, concede that Egyptian art and architecture, and she's just written an article in the New Yorker showing a particular medical view was taken by the Greeks uh, from Egypt. Why is it so implausible to suppose that the Greeks took other aspects of their culture, particularly in this period, I believe also much earlier as well? Uh, what is the reason for denying uh, the possibility, which was brought up by the Greeks themselves of transmission of mathematical and philosophical ideas at the same time. There's no reason to deny it. It's just simply to try and find what these ideas were. Now, in the case of the medical thing that you mentioned, uh, it happens to be a particularly wrong idea. And of course, wrong ideas can be transmitted as well as right ideas. And this is one thing that in tracing the history of the world, we tend to concentrate so much on the glorious achievements and the glories of Greece, you know, the glories of Egypt. There are also some non-glories and some of the medical ideas were one of them. I think we we're all very lucky not to have been living at that time. But I would say there's nothing implausible about it at all. And there is a great Greek interest in Egypt, as you say, and that surfaces very clearly in the later dialogues of Plato. But I think that if you're going to talk about stealing ideas from Egypt, which I know you are not, but others have, then you really have to show some parallel text and show what is done. I think the idea of some influence is something that could fruitfully be discussed and, preserve, uh, and pursued, and I would like to continue to do that and to, and to continue to encourage others to work on that. You want to follow up on your question? One thing I'm curious about, um, I had a quick look actually at the introduction um, to the second edition of uh, Bradley's uh, The Iceman Inheritance, a very uh, interesting book with a lot of 
interesting hypotheses about the, the origins of cultures and civilizations. Professor Clark wrote an introduction to the second addition to it in which he stated that the first show of European literary intelligence surfaced around 1250 BCE with the publication of two books of folklore, the Odyssey and the Iliad. And that struck me as somewhat curious because in fact, um, as far as most scholars seem to be able to tell, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey were composed actually orally. Um, and didn't reach a, a literary form, if you mean by that a, a written form, until probably the 6th century BCE in Athens. Um, there are obviously texts from Mycenae and Crete and elsewhere with real Greek in a literary form from before 1250, in fact going back probably to 1600 or so, uh, but this has significant implications for the idea um, which some scholars have put forth that Egyptian language uh, was deeply influential on the first form of Greek that we have, that is the linear B tablets. You know that I'm a specialist on chronology. I know that one comes first and two comes second. But what, I'm, what I was trying to, to get across is that in the 8th century to the 12th century, so the intellectual emergence of Europe, at a time Egypt was in its 23rd dynasty and dying after nearly 10,000 years of some forms of organized society, Europe intellectually was just being born. And I further maintain that Europe in general had nothing to do with the creation of Rome and Greece, and yet the challenge of Rome and Greece created Europe because they were scattered tribes, and the challenge of Rome and Greece brought them together, and they became a people strong enough to create a state. Yes. If anybody got any information to the con contrary, state the information to the contrary. I maintain that there was no Europe. You're giving Europe credit for things that happened before the first European war. Shoe or lived in a house that had a window. <laughs> and I'm saying that you have not read not just Massey, Joe Massey, his, his European disciple, Alvin, I mean, Chuchwad, signs and symbols of primordial man, the origins of, of religions, and his extensive work on Freemasonry. You not read the American disciple of, 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 of Massey, Alvin Boyd Kuhn, is who, who is this king of glory, one of the best written books on the Christ story, when he proves that Europe, the basis of European spirituality was taken directly from Africa. Professor Rogers, would you like to follow on your question? I mean, no one is actually maintaining that uh, literary Greek culture pre-existed um, any number of Near Eastern cultures Again, I, I find it a bit curious. I don't accept Egypt is Near East. I accept Egypt is part of, physically part of Africa, created by the Africans even, from the South. Even if, even if you, even if, even if I concede or admit or agree with you that Egypt is part of Africa, what I'm about to say. Thank you. There will be order. Thank you very much. Do I, do I detect some disagreement? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You my, my point was going to be that the most recent scholarship about the genesis of the, those two oral epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, 
points in fact in another direction to influence and that is in fact the Hittite Empire whose documents we can read very easily and there may well be independent confirmation of the historicity of some form of a Trojan War in those documents. And so what I'm really asking is, why is it that we're just really looking in one direction when we're talking about the origins of Greek civilization? Professor Clark? Well, um, when Alexander entered Egypt, he wrote home to his mother and said that he at last reached the land where the Greek gods began, Apollo and Zeus. And he wanted to consult one of the great African teachers of oracles. And the oracle asked, how old is this man? He said, 32. They said, in 20 years, maybe he'll be wise enough to ask me a question that I care to answer. <laughs> the main, my main concern is that they seem to have equated the civilizations of the Tigris and the Euphrates with the civilization of the Nile. What proof do you have that the civilization of the Tigris and the Euphrates predated the civilization of the Nile? I don't think that I said that, and I don't think that anyone maintains that. I think the, the Hittite Empire obviously comes at a much later period. I know very clearly when the Hittite Empire came, I know what damage they did, because I maintain that every pe people who came into Africa, Greeks, everything from modern day English, everybody that came into Africa, did Africa more harm than good. Yes, and that Africa owes nothing to outsiders in regard to development, because all of them declared war on African culture, war on African civilization, war on African ways of life. They began to bastardize Africa and confuse and create a kind of historical schizophrenia that the African had even got rid of to this very day. And they created whole words that did not previously exist, like Middle East. Middle from what? <laughs> In round two, we will continue. Uh, Professor Clark, you will ask the first question in round two of Professor Mary Lefkowitz. Well, Professor Lefkowitz, uh, at your own admission, you encountered J.A. E. Rogers four or five years ago. J.A. E. Rogers didn't say he was a historian. He was a searcher trying to find the role of the African personality in world history. He worked over 50 years of his life, gave a service, died broke. What gives you the audacity to think that you can dismiss Rogers out of hand? And what gave you the maturity to think that you can judge a writer like Sheikh Antadio, the finest historical writer we have produced in the 20th century? Sir, what do you with that? I try to ask questions of all the material I read. I try to answer those questions on the basis of the evidence, the historical evidence. It all, in my view, comes down to that. And I do not wish to criticize any individual at all. I am dealing only with written work. Uh, the people who write that I do not always know, and I have no individual or personal criticism of them. This is the way scholars, I'm sure as you know, proceed, and that is simply what I did in my book. I will leave it to everyone who reads the book to judge what I did. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, I think you have emphasized too much the word black. And we made the same mistake. Black tells you how you look, but it don't tell you who you are. The proper name of a people must always relate to land, history, and culture. 
I did not say Cleopatra was black. I quoted someone else who inferred that. My defense of Cleopatra is not on her blackness, but on the, no matter whatever she was, she was born in Africa. She defended, she was the, her manipulation of Mark Anthony and Caesar kept the worst aspect of Roman rule from the backs of Africa. I defend her as an African nationalist. And that's a good, good defense. And no matter what she did with her wares in and out of bed, there's a whole lot of people got less for it. Professor Clark, do you yes. think that we should always judge history in terms of race? <laughs> Look, there was no such thing as race in the psyche of the world until the Europeans put it into the psyche of the world. The Africans knew nothing about race and didn't think they belonged to anything called a race. And when the Africans saw the Europeans, because they have a traditional hospitality to strangers, they didn't fight them, they didn't kill, they were curious about them. And with the African explorers, especially Mundo Park, went into Africa, he, nobody hurt him, no, me, nobody shot at him, nobody showed any arrows at him. The Europeans went in peacefully, but the Africans heard that Mundo Park was a pork eater. Most people don't know it, but Africans were not great pork eaters, and they're not great pork eaters today. Pork was a meat you ate in a cer certain ceremonies, certain times a year. But we were not great pork eaters before we came to the United States, or were forced to the United States. But in the United States, we had to eat the part of the pigs that white folks threw away, so we made delicacies out of it and survived. I had this argument with Malcolm X. I said, if it wasn't for the black woman making delicacies out of pig feet, pig heels, guts, chitlins, well, you, will, you and I wouldn't be here arguing the point. <laughs> well, I, I'm afraid that you're not only a delinquent in African history, you're delinquent in African folklore. So much of our history is tied up with our folklore, but Europe has introduced words that didn't exist in anyone's vocabulary before. No one ever thought of anybody being inferior or superior. Intelligent people don't even, a human being can't be, you can't fall into that category. And nobody had the extensive problem the Europeans had with women because in the, in the period of feudalism in Europe, that lasted over a thousand years, the white woman in Europe was a vassal. But the African woman had never been a vassal in that sense. If you read Shekhanta Diop's The Culture Unity of, of Black Africa, dealing with the history of the matriarch, I mean, he's, he's got all evidence right there that we were the first people to support a woman as head of state. We were the first people to support a woman as riding head of her army. We were the first people to make women a god. But I wanted to follow up on a phrase that you said, and I didn't want to leave it uh, unaddressed, the issue of full disclosure. And it is to that I'd like to ask uh, the question of Professor Lefkowitz. Are you comfortable with the fact, you obviously were comfortable with the fact that your book, Not Out of Africa, subtitled How Afrocentrism Became an Excuse to Teach Myth as History, was underwrite written by several foundations that have uh, reportedly rightist leanings. I wondered whether this was a reflection of your own personal or ideological view, or whether you were just so cash strapped that you took money from anyone. <laughs> No one tells me what to think and no one tells me what to say except me and the main financing of this book was out of my own pocket. But surely you can appreciate the, the color of accepting fu uh, uh, funds from foundations that do not enjoy wide acclaim and receptivity. 
And I thought that maybe there was some concern on your part, in as much as you were interested in integrity, scholastic integrity and all, that you might have foregone the grants in the interest of academic and scholarly integrity. If they had asked of me to do anything, I would not have accepted these grants. They did not do that. Therefore, I didn't, the grants did not go to me. They went to Wellesley College, which had no objection to taking the money. But still, the question remains. You have a duty, do you not? In as much as you are preparing work, uh, the aim of which is to overturn the revisionism, you say, that is going on in black studies, particularly in African studies, this whole battle that you have been dealing with in terms of Afrocentricity, do you not, regardless of where Wellesley cho chose to accept money from, do you not, as a scholar, have an obligation to discern where this money is coming from, to see whether the source is compatible with your own views as a scholar? I did not see anything in the conditions of the grant that uh, inhibited what I did and what I meant to do or say or think. I believe that I acted with perfect integrity. Now, you may disagree with that, and you may disagree with the aims of those foundations and other foundations, and that is a, what we do in a free country. Until they are outlawed, I don't see what else can be done. Well, let me ask you the question perhaps more directly. Had there been, say, a foundation to wipe out scholarship of any sort, if such a foundation were to have given money to Wellesley College, would you have found it equally acceptable to take money from such a foundation to further your work? I don't know what foundation you're talking about. This seems to be a It totally was a hypothetical question. It's totally hypothetical. <laughs> I don't know what you're trying to force me to say or to, go, to compel no, I, me I, I, into, I, into what understand. corner I, you're I'm tending not, to put me. Uh, no, if I'm you want forcing, to go ahead and attack me, do. I'm not That's forcing fine. you to you're, say I, anything, you, Professor Lefkowitz. I'm just trying to elicit a cogent response from you. Well, you be the judge of my response. All right. I just wanted Professor Lesterwish to know some basic information about the concept of Afrocentricity. Uh, there's a lot of people who believe in the African awakening and discovering of their history and their culture who do not accept the word Afrocentricity because it's a compromise with the word African. It's either African centricity or it's nothing. And if she attacks Afrocentricity as the teacher of myth, have she attacked the nonsense about Columbus discovering America? <laughs> because he discovered absolutely nothing, and he committed an act of genocide. He set in motion an act of genocide, 10 times worse than the act of genocide in Europe called the Holocaust, as though that was the only Holocaust in the world. That event in Europe was wrong. And even if only six people were killed, it was wrong. But it was a matter started in Europe by Europeans that should have been solved in Europe by Europeans. We are that there is a spectrum of Afro and African centric views. I'm a little bit curious what you think then of the work of Asante, uh, who, as far as I know, does call himself an Afro centrist. Are you saying that Professor Asante's work actually is flawed conceptually? I'm, I'm saying that all work under the guise of Afro centrist is not perfect, but it is an, un an earnest effort to restore Africa to a proper commentary in human history. I think Professor Santi's work is written too fast and that some things he hadn't checked out as well as he need to. And I think too many times Afrocentricity becomes a personality cult, but that don't mean that I'm against African people discovering their, their history, their literature, their place in the political science of the world. That don't mean that I have not played a role in encouraging 
people to write about Africans and all the societies of the world. See, your talk keeps telling me what you have not read. You could not have been asking these questions about Afrocentricity. If you have not read Anacalypsis, two volumes dealing with the massive uh, uh, explosion of African people throughout the whole world, you could not possibly have read with any degree of understanding the three volumes, Africans in early Asia, Africans in early Europe, Africans in early America. We're not talking about no hearsay. We're talking about documents. Or J or, or, or Professor Joseph Harris's book, The Global Dimensions of the African uh, uh, Dispar. I, I don't know, I mean, you, you keep telling me, you keep confessing your ignorance with your questions. You have not read, I'm, I'm telling you, be, before Afrocentricity, radical Europeans had pioneered in this work. Now, I haven't even mentioned the radical black writers that you probably have not read. Now, if you read Chancellor Williams' chapter two in the book, Destruction of Black Civilization, yeah. read that chapter two called Egypt, Ethiopia's oldest daughter. And it deals with the Southern African origins of Egypt. If you read a book called Nubia, Corridor to Africa, once more you've got it. Also, you've got the early Arab slave trade. I keep saying nobody came into Africa to do African people any good. After the Romans had disgraced themselves trying to be early Christians, <laughs> the Africans thought that by accepting Islam, they could get the Romans off of their back. They were right. They did get the Romans off their back. But the Arabs replaced the Romans on their back, and the Arabs are still on their back. Speaking of book reading, um, I'm a little bit curious then, one book I have read is Civilization and Barbarism in which a scholar that we've talked a little bit about has written that the 18th dynasty in Egypt quote, colonized all the Aegean Sea and consequently brought the region of the world out of proto-history into the historical cycle of humanity by the introduction of writing, linear A and linear B. And I'm quite curious what Professor Banal thinks of such a hypothesis. Uh, clearly, uh, linear A and linear B do not come from Egyptian hieroglyphics. It is an Aegean and an Anatolian script. On the other hand, there's no doubt that Egyptian relations with the Aegean intensified a great deal during the 18th dynasty, and we have documents and paintings representing what the Egyptians interpreted as people from the Aegean bringing tribute to Africa. We also have scholars uh, like Professor Redford in Toronto who takes it for granted that there, were reg there was regular correspondence between the court in Mycenae and the court in Thebes. And there's no doubt which was the more powerful state. There is archaeological evidence of contact at that time. Uh, but Greece was already literate in its own scripts of uh, Linear A and Linear B. I was rather intrigued by Professor Rogers mentioning texts, Greek texts in the 16th century. I, I don't know what he's referring to there, that the Linear B texts are two or three centuries later. But that's a side issue, I agree. Actually, it's not a side issue. I'm afraid that Chadwick and others have now updated uh, the earliest Linear B tablets. But I would like to come back to you for a second now that we're talking about the 18th dynasty, because as I'm sure you know, the funeral stele of Amenhotep has been used, actually, to make some claims by some scholars about Egyptian dominion at that time over the Aegean. But since you've mentioned uh, Professor Klein, in fact, uh, both Professor Klein and Professor O'Connor at the Institute of Fine Arts here in New York, I think have shown fairly clearly that this, in fact, is not the case. Um, so this leads me to on Can to I come a back point. On? This leads me on to a point about source criticism, and I would like to raise this as a general point that one of the very curious things to us about Black Athena is that it does appear to us that the rules of the sociology of knowledge appear to apply 
to scholars of the eighteenth and nineteenth century but not for instance to harada this or tax which seem to support professor burn alice point of view and i'm wondering then what since we're speaking of principles of selectivity what then the principle of selectivity for the sociology of knowledge might be um, <clears throat> the reasons why i mean i don't accept herodotus uncritically i think one should try and check Herodotus wherever possible, but I think one should also check the 19th and 18th, 19th and 20th century scholars thoroughly. The reasons why I, on the whole, incline to believe Herodotus more than the 19th century scholars, I outlined before. That is that Greeks were torn in their attitude towards Egypt and towards Southwest Asia. Herodotus's main purpose was to illustrate the constant struggle between Europe and Asia, between Greeks and others. And so in a way, his description of Egypt as a source of great Greek culture goes against his ideological aim. And I find that more plausible than the 19th and the 20th century scholars who were profoundly influenced by Eurocentrism and by the triumphs of Europe in their own epoch to uh, push Greece into Europe and away from the Mediterranean and I feel that there was no countervailing force uh, affecting the 19th and 20th century historians uh, and the power of uh, racism and later anti-Semitism I think was uh, extraordinarily effective. I think, it's, I think it's also important for the audience to realize that while it's true that Herodotus is a very interesting and intriguing source for Egyptian and other cultures' history in the Near East, Herodotus also tells us that there were flying snakes in Arabia. He also tells us that in the north of India that there were ants that were actually larger than foxes but smaller than dogs which dug up gold uh, for their Indian masters to be sent to the Persian Empire as a form of tribute. I think that these kinds of stories in Herodotus should caution us against using Herodotus at face value. I think that people should think in a common sense sort of way about Herodotus. Herodotus was a Greek who knew no Egyptian. When he went to Egypt and asked questions about Egyptian culture, he was unable to check any of the stories that were told to him about Egyptian culture. He could read no documents in Egyptian. If anyone in this room went to a country where they could not speak the language and they could not read any of the texts of that culture, would you necessarily believe everything that you were told about that culture? Sorry, would you believe the reports rather than the, uh, what you were told? Uh, I, there are many Western travelers who have done that. Edgar Snow couldn't speak uh, sufficient Chinese and certainly couldn't read Chinese, and yet he wrote very interesting reports about China. It is possible for an intelligent person with judgment living in the country and viewing it to get good views. But I agree that Herodotus makes many statements that offend our laws of natural history and therefore they should be discounted immediately. On the other hand, the 19th century scholars believed in such things as races, uh, racial essences, the bad effects of racial mixture. Uh, all these things are much more relevant to the study of uh, relations between Egypt and Phoenicia and Greece than belief in uh, medi medium-sized ants. Uh, that uh, these are uh, the relevant issues and these are fantasies that were held by the 19th and early 20th century scholars. I'm surprised that no one mentioned the book When Egypt Ruled the East by Keith Seeley. Uh, what you call Western Asia, what, what is Western Asia, uh, mistakenly called the Middle East, was an extension of Africa itself. It was really uh, Northeast Africa. And the people were interchangeable, and we seem to have neglected this very important uh, aspect of then, in looking at Herodotus, Herodotus was no fool. Herodotus was a good reporter. When you told him something he didn't believe, he said he didn't believe. 
But he said, the tint of the complexion of the Ethiopians and the Egyptians seem to be the same. So let us at least concede, that's not an analysis now, that's an observation. Let us concede that Herodotus at least had good eyesight. <laughs> Is Professor Clark claiming that Herodotus did go to Ethiopia? No. He encountered Ethiopians as well as Egyptians. Uh, the, the people, the, uh, the, we, we, we misuse the word Egyptian anyway. That's a Greek word, and the Africans never call that country Egypt. But uh, he encountered both. Then there were other writers, Count Bonnie runs of empires, and, the Lepsis work uh, on the comparative study between the cultures of the upper and the lower Nile mean, mean that you, you people keep telling me what you have not read. Well, one of the things that we did read and we did actually put in our volume was a very long and comprehensive essay by Frank Snowden of Howard University who, pop out. Okay. who I'm afraid to say disagrees with you completely and cites many Greek writers and also Egyptian sources who make differences in their observations. Look, Frank Snowden, Skip Gates, appear, all these cop-outs running from black people and trying to get accepted by white people. We cannot be judged by these phonies. <laughs> now, you cannot, you will not dare judge the Jewish people in their plight in Germany by the Judaron. These are the Jewish police who chose other Jews to go to the gas chamber. Right. You will not judge the Jewish people by that, on that method. Right. And you cannot judge us by cop-outs and runaways and professional white ass kissers. <laughs> Let me answer. Excuse me. Yes, I, you're quite right. I don't make judgments upon people based on those kinds of slanders. I judge their evidence. I'm concerned, though, that so far I've been hearing bits and pieces of a discussion in specificity. You take fact A and you argue fact A and you get a response based on fact A. I'm not so sure, though, that you have accomplished the major objective here tonight, which is to argue that bodies of work have no legitimacy. I would like you, in concluding, to at least get to that issue uh, that entire bodies of work have no legitimacy. I'm, I'm baffled by that introduction about bodies of work. Um, I don't think that that has anything to do with anything that either Professor Lefkowitz or I have said. But since you've asked me to conclude something about what we are trying to persuade people of, well, what I would say is this, but that but professors... Excuse me. Hold on, please. I just don't want you to conclude about something that was not asked. So I would like to document it from the book. You claim, for example, and I'm reading from the, the cover, the back cover, uh, the contributors to this volume argue that Burnell's claims are exaggerated and in many cases unjustified. You say also in the work, Bernal proposed a radical reinterpretation of the roots of classi classical civilization, contending that ancient Greek culture derived from Egypt and Phoenicia, and that European scholars have been biased against the notion of Egyptian and Phoenician influence on Western civilization. 
since this is a 20 uh, member compendium, uh, I think it suggests that they're attacking a body of work. I, ho I hope that in reading the back jacket cover and our description of Professor Bernal's enterprise, that we've been fair to him uh, insofar as what he takes his project to be about. As far as I understand it, I think it is fair. My conclusion about that has to be framed in terms of what the object of that body of work is about. Professor Bernal says that his object, the political, the cultural purpose, political purpose of Black Athena is to lessen European cultural arrogance. My question is, does it lessen European cultural arrogance to argue that early Greek culture was derived from Egypt and or Phoenicia? If we start out from the premise that we study Egypt or Phoenicia for what they contributed to early Greek culture, my opinion is that we are undervaluing Egypt and Phoenicia. And therefore, the project itself is, in the end, essentially Eurocentric and is its own refutation. I think one can agree with the project of lessening European cultural arrogance completely, and that we applaud all efforts to do so. What we are concerned with is trying to establish what historical evidence shows the influence of what on what. And this is not a project which any of us here can complete at all. That many people must be involved in this and it requires the thought and efforts of, of a lot of us to do it. We would like to think that it can be redone without rewriting history altogether or without claiming that there has been a huge European cover-up of information. There is certainly true, you can claim that, but please remember, you must also show that it has been done. There are many things that Europe has been guilty of and responsible for, and certainly the covering, not the covering up, I don't mean to say that, but the absolute refusal to acknowledge the history of Africa, which I made reference to in my opening remarks, is something that we must continuously work on redressing much more must be learned, much more must be studied. I am very much in favor of that, and I believe that can start also in our teaching of American history, where in many cases, the whole history of the African-American contribution to American history has been ignored and neglected, and there are brilliant writers out there whose works are not being read. I think we should change all that. But we do not have to rewrite ancient history completely in order to do some of these important things. I would just simply ask, let us investigate carefully the degree of Egyptian influence on ancient Greece, but we must also investigate the Near Eastern cultures such as Phoenicia and the Hittites. After all, Phoenicia gave ancient Greece her alphabet. They didn't learn the alphabet from the Egyptians. It was too hard. It was easier to get it from the Phoenicians. And we must begin to work on those lines. I would like to see everyone work also on a period we haven't discussed much here tonight where we really do see Egyptian influence on Greek culture, and that is in the Hellenistic period after Alexander got there and Greeks were living in Egypt, a huge number of Greeks were living in Egypt. There I think you can see some real influence. This is now the third debate that we have had, and I'm very struck by what I see as a discrepancy between 
uh, Mary Lefkowitz's speech and her writing. Uh, that in speech, she is all sweetness and light and for open debate and openness in culture. Her writing is very different. The title, Not Out of Africa, is extremely provocative. Uh, and it reads, the, the, the uh, text uh, carries on in the same way. And I'd like to quote to you a letter I received from probably the most distinguished active classicist in the world today who actually agrees with her on, acad on the academic side. Nevertheless, he writes, I do not find her exposition cool, detached, and reasonable, despite her efforts to make it seem like it, that. It is, in fact, as I wrote in my review, an impassioned polemic. Of course, Mary wants to look scholarly and attached, but hers is the scholarship of the National Association of Scholars, which is founded, funded by the same people that funded uh, Not Out of Africa. And that leads us back to where Professor Clark began on the general political context in which this book has appeared. <laughs> because she is a pawn in somebody else's game. As I said in the beginning, it is beyond the like and dislike of Afrocentricity, which has not even developed enough to be called a discipline. It is a world war to prepare the mind to accept the re-enslavement of Africa to remove from the mind of all people anything good that the African has done and to ignore the fact that Europe set up Africa to fall apart by imposing on Africa to miseducated Africans a nation state. The nation state is un-African. The African thrived at his best in the territorial state. Many cultures, many languages, side by side, challenging each other, fertilizing each other. What you might call an empire, if you study the last thousand years before slavery, the development of independent states in the Western Sudan, Ghana, Mali, Sungay, destroyed by the invasion from North Africa by the Arabs, the Arabs attacking the North African Muslims, attacking the African Muslims, and destroying the great university of St. Korea, and exiling its greatest scholar, Ahmed Baba who admonished his students, believe in God and science. The Africans never separated God from science. The priests were scientists. The priest was the most knowledgeable person. That's why you had the concept of a priest God. Now if they wipe this out of the mind of our children and our children look at television and sound bites and think they were nothing but a nothing, when they re-enslave Africa, they're going to say, good father. They're preparing us to accept it. They're preparing the world to accept the re-enslavement of African people all over the world. And I'm saying that Ms. Leskowitz is a pawn in their game in the tragic irony of it. She is the pawn in the game of people who turn their backs on her people and let them be killed by the millions. American intelligence, French intelligence, British intelligence, the intelligence of the Western world knew exactly what was happening to the Jews in Germany. We raised our voice against this in the old Harlem History Club, 1939 to the death of the, the leader in 1941. If you think that, oh, I mean, if we get into the nonsense about black anti-Semitism, 
Blacks have always had a sentimental attachment to the Jews. They actually believe the Bible. You know we are the true believers. We out Pope to Pope, we out Muhammad Muhammad. But religion has always been a political thing to Europeans and still is. And when it no longer serves them politically, they're gonna discard it. They turned their backs and let this happen. Now they're creating a new game because Europe has spoiled Europe. They want to take some geography outside of Europe. They say the people they're going to take the geography from are unworthy. They can't rule themselves. Of course, they cannot rule themselves in artificial states set up by the Europeans. Yeah. First place the Africa has to do is just get rid of these borders. Reestablish the borders along the old lines and integrate Africans into Africa. Uh, my question is for you, Dr. Lefkowitz. Did the ancient Greeks espouse white supremacy? Thank you. I believe that the ancient world in general did not have the problems with racism which our society is so fraught with today. And that is one of the great reasons why I, in many ways, am happier studying the ancient world. Would you say that James Bresky, who founded the uh, Institute of Oriental Studies for the University of Chicago, is a liar? Then you haven't read his work because I have it right here. And he made no bones about what the Greeks got from the Egyptians. And when Dr. Clark mentioned to you about Herodotus, Herodotus said this. He said, I cannot say with certainty which supposition is the right one, but I noticed this myself before I asked any question, both in cultures and in Egypt. And the Egyptians, the Colossians remember the Egyptians much more distinctly than the Egyptians remember them. For the Colossians said that they thought that they were offspring from the soldiers left there by Caesar, who was the head of the Egyptians. He went on further to tell you that the Colossians, the Egyptians and Ethiopians, yes. had not seen a wooden hair. Okay, of the shrine of Amos and visit from the temple. Uh, first of all, if you reach in Wezu, he talks about um, Aristotle calling the Egyptians cowards in Kofiti because they were black. So there was some form of uh, supremacy in Greece around that time. My question to Araba is this. Your question to whom, sir? Well, basically, any, anybody can read. Okay. Why do these um, Hellenists or whatever you call them, these Greek scholars, uh, you know, seven classes find it so difficult, okay, to admit the Africanity of uh, Egyptian civilization when you have practices like circumcision, which even Semites like Abraham come to the area to learn and all of that. When you look at the American Heritage Dictionary, for instance, even though you have African words in the dictionary, we are not part of the world root of languages and all of that. How can you cut off a whole seminar culture and yet refuse to accept, I mean, you refuse to accept the contribution of uh, African civilization to, uh, to, to Mycenaeum or whatever, and yet you appropriate our languages and our cultures, even though we basically we've been excluded from this language. All right. Linguistically, um, I don't think that Anyone I know believes that ancient Greek, uh, in its majority, is derived from the Afro-Asiatic language group. Um, I think that, yes, I think that the placement of Greek into the Indo-European language group sets it in a, a different context. I, I have no problem um, acknowledging Greece's debts to many different Near Eastern cultures. Doesn't bother me at all. Anyway, I do believe that your book is a part of this whole scheme, which I believe will be carried throughout this country.
But anyway, uh, that aside, I, I'd like to get onto my questions. I, I did flip through your book, and, and meaning flipping through, because I just found it very, um, for, for lack of words, I, I would have to go back to Mr. Clark's, uh, Dr. Clark's what? sophomoric book, because it left many holes, and you contradicted yourselves, uh, yourself with the very same contradictions that you were blaming all these other authors for so having the, done. So the question, so the question is, comes yeah. to, uh, was Socrates black? And I felt that you were like beating a dead horse on, on its head. Um, this is a, rather than ask that question, I would like to ask you, um, from this quote, it says, uh, I got it out of a book today, Socrates was prosecuted on a charge of impiety, quote, for not worshiping the gods whom the city worships, for introducing religious innovative uh, innovations, and for corrupting the young men. Now this was, uh, I, I believe, in the trial of, of Socrates. And the, the question being, if so, this is indigenous Greek philosophy coming out from philosophy, and he was eventually put to death by talking about his philosophy and influencing the young minds of, of, of Greece, um, Athens, then, uh, I'm not sure if it was Athens or Sparta, I, I forget. But then my question to you is, what then is so Greek about Socrates? So Thank that's you. my question to Mary Lefkowitz. Um, but let me, uh, let me just say that Socrates, um, tells us himself that he never really left Athens for, except on military campaign, and he stayed within Greece. Now, uh, introducing new gods, I think, was a reference to his own personal god, and that's why he was tried for impiety. Uh, people did not have their own personal gods. They had to believe in the gods the city believed in. It's a long story. There's a considerable bibliography on that, if you're interested. Um, I'm sure somebody at, at your university could tell you. As for my being part of a conspiracy to destroy all sorts of things, I am not part of any conspiracy at all. That's the right question the wrong way. The racism that we know today started in the 15th and the 16th century as a rationale for slavery. Whatever harm the Romans and the Greeks did, they had no racism compared to the racism of today. Otherwise, why would there be three African emperors of Rome? And why would they hit? Why would there be three African popes in the early Roman church? And why would September Saviors become the governor of England? The country is going to become England. I'm saying that if you charge the Greeks with the same kind of color prejudice we have today, you're charging them wrong. They've got enough crimes that they're guilty of <laughs> without that. They had a respect for talent wherever they found it, even among the people they conquered. And the people they conquered had upward mobility to the extent they fitted into the Greek or the Roman political intentions of that day. Now, I have gone to England and had the privilege of going in the basement of the British Museum. As a commoner, naturally I couldn't go, but when they asked the other person with me, what is your authority to enter? and look at the sites in the basement of the British Museum. He was a Caribbean person who lived in America most of his life, but he wasn't a citizen, so he had officially been knighted by the Queen. And so he pulled out his card, <laughs> and the door to the basement opened. <laughs> and we saw the picture of Herodotus, matted hair, pug nose, similar to mine. <laughs> it was in the statue was in the basement of the British Museum where it will stay <laughs> and not be on display. But I don't argue Herodotus on the basis of his blackness or anything else. I argue on the fact that he had wandered away from his people. He had learned a concept and a way of living, a way of morality 
different from that of his people. So just like Jesus Christ, when he came back among his people, he was preaching something that alien to that belief. Here's here, this food trip. We're driving the money changes from the temple. What do they think we're going to make money? <laughs> what, in other words, what kind of Jew is this? <laughs> A strange kind of Jew. <laughs> he don't want us to engage in trade. The Romans didn't want to have anything to do with it. So when the Roman governor was, when he was put on trial for sorcery, uh, the Romans, he wasn't harming the Romans, he wasn't even preaching to the Romans, he was preaching to his own people. And so he pushed them back and says, he's your king. And they pushed him back toward the Romans, said, not my king. <laughs> He coming with all those foolish ideas. He he can't hang it out in Egypt. <laughs> so Herodotus has been. I didn't say he went to Africa. I don't know. But he was influenced by African moral thought. Thank you. Um, the agenda of the right of um, and the political context. That, that lets a president of my school, Yolanda Moses, uh, dismantle and uh, ethnically cleanse um, the ethnic studies and the black studies and Latino studies, Jewish studies, um, Asian studies up at City College. And because I have no respect for you because up at City College, we are fighting there every day. All right. For, well. what, for, for what the question is, I want Dr. Clark to explain how this is what, what's this doing to the train of thought in our universities and how it lets this, this, people politically dismantle our universities as we know Thank them. you for oh, your look. question. Soon after the black studies explosion, whites began to plan how to let them use this as a political plaything until they got their act together and that strength together in order to destroy it. It wasn't meant to be no one if you ever got this simple thing, people never educate you in the technique you use, you can use to take their power away from them. See, education has but one honorable purpose, one alone, everything else is a waste of time. That to train the student to be a responsible handler of power. No one ever wants us to be responsible handlers of power. I'm saying that it has nothing to do with political lines. The left don't want us to be responsible no more than the right. But they want to dominate us in a different way from the right, and they think they can dominate us better. It's an argument of not of whether we will be free, but who will enslave us. And had we, we should have accepted the responsibility of making black studies strong enough to take this assault. We could have anticipated it and argued with it, but we, spent, we dissipated too much energy arguing among ourselves over triviality. We are partly to blame for what is happening. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Your question, please. How did uh, University of North Carolina come to choose them? Did they make the application for the grants? And what are the foundations? Thank you. There's a simple answer. There were none. 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 Zero. Zilch. None. Okay. Except for a grant from Wellesley College. Wait. Now listen, you hear me. Wellesley College student assistance. Two students who did research paid for by student research grants from Wellesley College. We thank Wellesley College for yes. that. No, we had no outside grants to write that book at all. The University of North Carolina had nothing to do with funding the book. They simply came to us three and a half years ago and asked us to put together the book. So you, you cite here, you cite in the, uh, in the preface to your book, we are, uh, let me see. We thank Molly Levine of Howard University for generously allowing us to use the bibliography she had assembled and the Ford Foundation. That's through Wellesley College. Wellesley, no, the Ford Foundation 
and Wellesley College, not through Wellesley the College, Ford, for grants to support editorial assistance. Well, I'm sorry, but the Ford Foundation has a standing grant with Wellesley College through which Wellesley College disperses money to student research assistance. There is no political... Well, All right, well that's, the, that's answer. the answer. The answer is there's no uh, direct foundation link. Exactly. You claim to be in the interest of sharing knowledge and information for the betterment of the students that you teach and the people that you influence. For the duration of this debate, your colleagues on your right-hand side have given you books and information that challenge what you've said. I have not heard anything from you of a willingness to read or reassess some of the conclusions you came through with your book. So what I'd like to know is now that you've been provided with that information, and if you're truly in the interest of telling the truth and doing the right thing, will you revisit some of what you've read? We, Thank we you for your question. We wouldn't be here if we weren't interested in learning other people's views about these topics, but I would urge you to um, go and look at the bibliography of the book, uh, which is very, very extensive and does, in fact, include many of the titles that we've talked about here this evening. But that's not the question. The question was, will you, given the information that you've been given tonight uh, by opposing views, let's say, are you going to take another look? Are you going to yeah. revisit Black Athena Revisited? Exactly. That, Actually, that was my question. We're, we were told by Professor Bernal that he is working on a volume called Black Athena Writes Back, or is that right? Uh, so we're waiting for that. We thought it was only fair to give him a but chance. But you really to, didn't answer my question. Well, I think I, think I did. No, no, I'm, I'm, no disrespect. I just want to know, are you, once now that you've been provided with some of these books, some of the information, names, in the interest of supposed scholarship, would you take a second look at some of the things that they're saying? Sure, sure. Yes? Yes. yes. Yeah. It was noted that, that, that neither Professor Lefkowitz nor Professor Rogers seemed to have written down any of the books cited. Well, that's, that's not fair. <laughs> all right, your question, please. We didn't have to write down all the books because we have actually read a great many of them. I wrote down several notes. You, I do right. not, if I do not agree with you, it does not mean that I have not read the same books. Could you, as a graphic designer, could you explain that cover? I mean, you know. I didn't, I didn't, I'm not a graphic designer. The cover was the cover of the New Republic article the, the, of the New Republic when my article that was a review of Martin Bernal's Black Athena first appeared. But you used it, it on the cover of your book. P, the, the publishers decided to use it again because it was a New Republic book and because it, they thought people might remember the original cover. Well, it appeared in cover? 1992. It appeared in 1992 when the Spike Lee film of Malcolm X had been very popular and everyone was wearing X caps. But I see, since we're talking about not out of Africa, how do you get an X cap? <laughs> the cover features a bust, I suppose this is Socrates? Yes. Could be, but it I don't think, I think it's generic it's, philosopher. Myself. Is it Plato? Is it, uh, it's, it's not Herodotus. He doesn't have woolly hair. <laughs> Well, Herodotus wouldn't have had woolly hair. That was the Colchians <laughs> and the Egyptians. But it is a, it is a, a bust of a, I don't know how to describe this, other than you see this kind of yeah, sculpture it's a generic all the time. Greek philosopher. A Homeric figure with a, an X cap on. Anyway, thanks. First of all, Mr. Bernal, maybe you'd be willing to explain how anti-Semitism got involved with Black Athena. Uh, professor, what is your name, the lady, I'm sorry? Lefkowitz. Lefkowitz, you brought up the subject of anti-Semitism. I want to know, what does that have to do with Black Athena? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Henry Clark or Dr. Bernal can answer that. Thank you. Uh, most people who accuse you of being anti-Semitic have not even explained exactly what is a Semitic. It started off as a linguistic term. How did it become a racial term? There are Semitic speaking people of all colors. So it's not an exclusive thing for the people who adopted the name Jew 
mainly in Europe, because the word Jew was not used widely in the ancient world. We knew people of the Hebrew faith, but there are people of the Hebrew faith in India, China, and through it's a universal religion. A lot of people belong to it, including some misguided blacks who call themselves black, black Jews. <laughs> now, if you want to belong to the Hebrew faith, you just belong to the Hebrew faith. Is this a right? Why do you have to attach color to it? The Indians don't call themselves, you, you know, brown, brown Jews. They just call themselves people who belong to the Hebrew faith. And when they went to, to Israel, they got the shock of their lives by being reduced to second-class citizenship. All right, can I come back? I think that Black Athena has uh, become involved with anti-Semitism in two ways. That is, in my book, I do spend about half the text, or almost half the text, talking about Phoenician influences, that is, Semitic-speaking uh, influences on, uh, on Greece, uh, and how anti-Semitism among European scholars in the late 19th and early 20th century affected the interpretation of that, those influences on Greece. So that has one big aspect, and I've been attacked for that by Tony Martin and some others for spending too much time on uh, looking at uh, Jewish or Semitic influences, not Jewish influences, Semitic influences. The other way in which it's become loosely attached to Black Athena is the way in which some, uh, a very few, of the uh, people, uh, the African Americans who are or, or who claim to be anti-Semitic, uh, have uh, liked Black Athena, but that I think is a much less important issue. I've been fighting anti-Semitism in my book and I, this is something that uh, I find ext extremely central. It may not be central to this audience, but it is very important to me and the way I wrote it. Yes, we, we, share, we share Professor Bernal's view that there were some scholars in 18th and 19th century Europe who, for reasons of anti-Semitism, sought to exclude all kinds of people speaking Semitic languages from the story of the origins of Greek culture. Thank you. Your question. Now, uh, what I'd like to, uh, to, to, to know is, first off, <laughs> just one let question. me just read something here for you. And this comes out of Aristotle, okay? Uh, it comes out of Aristotle. We're talking about, we're talking about philosophy, but one okay? One question and quickly, please. Yeah, quickly. The military class and the farming class should be separate. Even today, this is still the case in Egypt, as it is in Crete. The practice began in Egypt, okay? Then you come back again, it says, uh, it was thus in southern Italy that a southern sy uh, system of uh, common tables originated. As we know, the, the population of southern Italy are black folks. Uh, then it com comes back and says, uh, the other institutional, the, the other institution uh, mentioned above, the division of uh, the body, politic, into classes originated in Egypt, not in Crete. It continues. No, no, don't continue. Well, Get to your one, question. Last one, last one. Get to your question quickly, please. The history of Egypt attests the antiquity of all political institutions. Here is Aristotle is giving his expertise on philosophy to the Egyptians, yet you sit there and say that it had nothing to do with Egypt. Explain, please. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that we have said that uh, Greek politics have nothing to do with Egyptian politics. In fact, one of the more interesting arguments that I think you'll find in our book is Sumerian scholars believe that a form of what for want of a better term could be called democracy actually existed perhaps on the banks of the Tigris and the Euphrates in about 1800 BCE. Um, I didn't quite understand uh, the comment about um, the encyclopedia definition of Semitic, but I think I agree completely with Professor Clark that Semitic is not uh, a racial term. It is, not a, um, it is not a term even of culture. In principle, it should be a linguistic term. Can I come back briefly? Yes. Um, I think one of the reasons why the title of my book is The Afro-Asiatic Roots 
uh, is because Afroasiatic is a super family which includes both ancient Egyptian and Semitic and many other African languages like the Chadic group and Hausa and all the rest of it. Uh, and it was one of the uh, reasons why I wanted to be able to include both the uh, <coughs> Semitic and the Egyptian linguistic and other influences uh, on, uh, uh, on Greece. We at Temple University, the African American Studies Department, are taking serious Dr. Clark question. We're going to be issuing within the two months a comprehensive document that go back thousands of years that includes scholars from every part of the African world, including Dr. John Henry Clark, Fan Fanon, everyone from Star Otep. So this will be coming out within two months. So this will, this will answer a lot of the questions that are being laid today. So we're taking a scholarship serious. Now what I'm going to do, the question is to those two professors from Wesley. I am kind of, uh, I find the book very disingenuous. Uh, I found one of the person that you mentioned in a little inspirational in the book, uh, Dr. Uh, ben, uh, I would be loved Dr. Ben Jackahannon. And I've known him for over 22 years. Your question, and, please. And Dr. Ben, in his 22 years of being a, a, a chemitologist, had never said one time that he was an Afrocentrist. I mean, why did you say that Dr. Uh, ben speaking at Wesley College was one of the reasons that you picked up on this project to, to, to dis make the Afrocentric project disingenuous. Thank Dr. You. Ben has never said he is Afrocentric, not one time in the 22 years I've known him, and I know other people that known him, like Dr. Jefferson here, probably more years than that. So what is this, is this poor scholarship, or is this just an attempt to continue to attack on Africa? Why do you find Africa so All right, so thank difficult? you. I was simply talking about uh, an incident at Wellesley when Dr. Ben Yokanon talked about the library at Alexandria and claimed that Aristotle had stolen his works from it. I perhaps the term Afrocentrism has become too widely gener generalized. We all have been discussing tonight a great many ways in which it's been used and misused. Professor Asante at, at Temple, as you of course know very well, believes, and I think this is quite true, that he has invented that term, but like all things that one invents, it gets out of hand. So um, that's my answer. I believe you're right that Dr. Ben refers to himself as a chemitologist. So when George Will, in his review of your book, cited Dr. Ben and this incident in 19, I believe it was 1993, when he was at Wellesley College, did you correct George Will? I don't get much of a chance to correct reviews of your book until after they're written. But uh, they, they, it's sent out as part of your promotional package. <coughs> well, I don't send out my promotional package, but I'm not responsible for what George Will writes. I mean, no, you're no. making me responsible for is, absolutely everything in the whole world. It's very interesting. I wish I had this power. But what I do with it? Wow. George Will said, made the point that the question <coughs> made, uh, basically um, ascribing to Dr. Ben Yochanan this Afrocentric label, and since the article is disseminated to the public and to people like me in media as part of a promotional package for your book, I would imagine that had you had serious differences of opinion with George Will, a conservative writer, uh, about this particular label or association with Dr. Yohanan, you may have either withdrawn that piece of literature from your publicity package, or you may have written directly to Mr. Will uh, and corrected him. I don't quite see why George Will shouldn't use the language that he wishes to use and be responsible for it himself. That is his that is his prerogative and his problem. And, and, don't, and you don't, you're trying to And you don't mind inaccurate information being associated with your book? A great deal of inaccurate information about my book has been associated with okay. it tonight. It's the country of Egypt. Do you believe Egypt is a part of Africa? And if not, can you explain why? And can we start from here and go across? I think there's unanimous agreement that Egypt is part of Africa. I'll, ask, I'll answer the question yeah. with a question. Have you ever seen a complete map of Africa? Let, 
the microphone. If you see a complete map of Africa, Egypt is focused, oh, then imagine a woman's body. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Egypt is the culture womb of that body. Although its original population came from the south, and there's so many documents to prove this, it's not even an arguable point. If Egypt gave birth to a civilization, the impregnation started in the south. And Egypt became the beneficiary of the largest gathering of technology, of technicians in history. Because the Nile Valley stretches 4,000 miles into the body of Africa. When Egypt discovered massive agriculture, she could feed a lot of people, she could house a lot of people. And people with mixtures of gods and beliefs brought it all together into one powerful belief. Egypt was the culmination of several African civilizations and not just Egypt alone. One of the main reasons the European can't leave it alone because he did not create it. Why would he come from Europe during the latter part of the Ice Age and create something in Egypt and go back and live under the Ice Age 2,000 years before he built a European shoe? <laughs> come on, make, let, let's, let's be real now, let's be real. Why, would, why are they so generous to other people? when they're not generous to themselves. Europe under feudalism was Europe under slavery, whites enslaving whites. And, and, and you study the condition of the European woman during feudalism. Thank you. She, she never had any rights they did, but the, uh, so fit to Dr. Bernal? Of course it's part of, uh, of Africa, and I don't think anybody on this panel would disagree with that. Um. All right, I just thought I would read this because some of you may think I was making it up. It's from Newsweek magazine from February the 19th, 1996. It's George Will writing in Newsweek titled The Last Word, and the headline is Intellectual Segregation. Afrocentrism's many myths constitute condescension, he says, George Will of all people, toward African Americans. It begins, in 1993, Dr. Yosef A. A. Ben Yohanan, who was advertised as, quote, a distinguished Egyptologist, unquote, although he is not a scholar of Egyptian language or civilization, delivered the Martin Luther King Memorial Lecture at Wellesley College. Unfortunately for him and for other Afrocentrists, and that is quoted, and fortunately for the rest of us, Mary Lefkowitz, a scholar of antiquity, teaches there and attended the lecture. Wow. <laughs> so my question still stands. If this is going out as part of your package, this was faxed to me by your publicist today, and I thought that if you disagreed strongly with Mr. Will's characterization, then you would instruct your publicity department to not send this literature out. Maybe if, you know, people's work like Mary uh, Lefkowitz and others are gonna be used as a kind of a, a, an attack dog to resurrect things like three-fifths of a man, pe penal slavery, and, and uh, geo-global corporate terrorism. What do you think? It, it, uh it's, 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 a part of, it's a part of the concerted effort, and the effort is international, and it is part of the world war to prepare the mind of people to accept the re-enslavement of Africa. And the irony and the tragedy, Professor Lester Wiss, is that the same people who are going to re-enslave Africa in the morning might turn on her people in the evening. I have no doubt. Thank you very much. I, I would like also to augment what I just read from George Will, from, from uh, Dr. Lefkowitz's own book, Not Out of Africa, How Afrocentrism Became an Excuse to Teach Myth is History. You said tonight that you, you didn't agree that Dr. Ben Yohanan was a, an Afrocentrist, but you write in your introduction you, you said... I didn't say that. Well, let me read what you said. You can read what I said. 
I can read what I said. Uh, normally, if one has a question about a text that another instructor is using, one simply asks why he or she is using that book. But since this conventional line of inquiry was closed to me, I had to wait until I could raise my questions in a more public context. That opportunity came in February 1993, when Dr. Yosef A. A. Ben Yochanan was invited to give Wellesley's Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Lecture. You've just heard the exact words in George Will's column. Posters described Dr. Ben Yohanan as, quote, a distinguished Egyptologist, unquote, and indeed that is how he was introduced by the then president of Wellesley College. But I knew from my research in Afrocentric literature that he was not what scholars would ordinarily describe as an Egyptologist, that is, a scholar of Egyptian language and civilization. Rather, he was an extreme Afrocentrist author of many books describing how Greek civilization was stolen from Africa, how Aristotle robbed the library of Alexandria, and how the true Jews are Africans like himself. Now it's almost verbatim uh, what George Will wrote, and it was just there you said you, so what didn't you disagree with with Dr. Ben Yochanan? How, what would label would you now agree that he is? Dr. Lefkowitz. Well, I think you are trying to make me say what I didn't say. I never said that. I never. I, you read what I said. That's what I stand by. I, I use. Uh, maybe you don't agree with the way I use the term Afrocentrism. You think it's wrong. You maybe. Uh, no, I'm not. Because within the last 600 years, I mean, you can look at the last 600 years, and you can find many, many things that need to be revised in our, in our history, in the way we are teaching our history to our young right now. If you don't see that, okay, let me ask you, what, what would you change, what would you revise within the last 600 years of our history that is being taught now, all right, to our children, all right? That we have to come in, uh, when our children come home every day and, you know, we see what they're being taught, about Columbus, they're still calling it natives Indians, all right? They're, uh, Your question. We, uh, what would you change? And how soon would you think would be, I mean, how, what is quick enough for you? I mean, you know, should we take 10 years to change these things? Thank you. Every time, history must be rewritten and rethought and reconsidered. And in the light of the progress, if there is been and it has been any progress, I think there has, then we can rewrite every history. But we do not rewrite the basic facts of history, which are things very simple. Let me just tell you things you have to stick by. In writing the history of the Civil War in this country, either you have to say Lee surrendered to Grant or Grant surrendered to Lee. Both didn't happen. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Uh, we can't rewrite those basic facts, but we can rewrite interpretations, and there's been a great deal omitted uh, in the history, and maybe uh, you've, you've cited some some terms that are condescending, terms that should not be used anymore, that's another example of something that can be done. But I'm not going to be able to rewrite in my lifetime the whole of the school curriculum. That's up to all of us. I also think, I think that that's a very good and fair question. My answer to that is that what worries me the most is not rewriting history, because history is always provisional. We try as human beings with the evidence that we have to build up a picture which in the best circumstances is as accurate and as true to the evidence as we can find it. What worries me, and to speak I hope directly to your point, is history which is being written for useful purposes. What worries me about that is that when you say useful, what is useful to one person may lead to very significant problems for someone else. And in the, and in the, hold it, in, the, in, the 19, in the 1930s and in the early 1940s, there were groups of people in Italy and in Germany 
who wrote useful histories about minority groups. Those useful histories ended at places like Auschwitz and Treblinka. And that is exactly the reason why, that's exactly the reason why. Excuse me, please, we must have some order. The standard, the standard for our revisions has to be, I believe, accuracy and truth as far as we can establish it, based on probability, since history is not an exact science. Dr. Clark? Uh, let's stop talking about usefulness and talk about honesty. Let's talk about the making of the United States, the design of this country. That it was designed as a haven for free white Protestant males, middle class and up, those who agree with the prevailing political status quo and who own property. Everybody else in this country who think this country was designed for them are telling themselves a lie. The Jews were out of it, the Catholics were out of it, the Quakers were out of it. Now look at who's, who's held power in this nation. <laughs> Only one non-Protestant president, and how long did they last before they killed him? When they said liberty and justice for all, that's the all they were talking about. The other people think they were talking about them. <laughs> the country have not betrayed any promise to you, had even made any promise to you. What even talking about you in the first place? <laughs> let's talk, let's tell the real truth about all the founding fathers being slaveholders. Let's read the letters George Washington wrote when he, uh, wanted some special molasses from the Caribbeans and he offered to send one trained nigger as payment for the molasses. Let's not take George Washington out of history, but let's put the blacks in history along with him. Let's talk about James Fortan who made the, made the tents for George Washington and George Washington found that those matted, wax matted cloth on the tents was stronger than the cloth in the breeches of his soldiers. He asked James Fortan to make some breeches of that same cloth. Those breeches made by a black man turned that terrible third and fourth winner of the American Revolution. Don't take George Washington out, but put James Fortin in with it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bernal? Is this a response to a question? If, if you want to just add something, if you had a chance. Uh, are, we still, we, are we still getting on with the questions, sir? No, uh, questions are done. The uh, questions are done? Yes. Okay, well, I think this has been, uh, there's been some intellectual blood spilt, but uh, I find it very uh, interesting. Uh, but I'd like to end on a note uh, that Mary Lefkowitz uh, raises in her book, a point raised uh, many times by Arthur J. Schlesinger, J.R., uh, that Afrocentrist history is purely an attempt uh, to promote group self-esteem. Whereas history, and I'm quoting, should consist of dispassionate analysis, judgment, and perspective. In fact, this uh, desirable goal is very seldom reached in schools, uh, which nearly always stress the achievements of the uh, dominant group or the majority group in that school. Nevertheless, I quite agree with them that one should try to transcend these uh, intellectual or social environments and achieve objectivity as far as it's possible to do so. However, classics, based as it, in, as it is in what I call the Aryan model, uh, <coughs> with its insistence on a European and pure Greece, is an extreme example of feel-good scholarship for Europeans. Well, that brings us to the end of this meeting, I want you to give yourselves a hand for hanging in here. And our panelists a hand also for coming. And on behalf of WBAI, I want to thank you all for coming and keep listening to your favorite station, which is WBAI 99.5 FM. Thank you and good night.